I am a uh, um, professor down at uh, Madigan Army Medical Center, so I spend some of my time down at the uh, taking care of the Army folks and their dependents, as, I'm, as well as being up here. So I have the pleasure of uh, working at two different places, taking care of two different populations. I haven't jumped out of an airplane in a long time, so my knees are broken. Um, so I'm going to give a talk on uh, neuroangiographic anatomy. If I go too fast, uh, I apologize. That's the way I speak. Uh, there are uh, all of the SSF uh, videos are actually archived, so you can actually uh, go to YouTube um, and look for them. Um, this uh, this talk uh, is listed as SSF. If you just look up SSF, uh, Yin's Low in Anatomy, you'll uh, you should find it. Good references for you to use. I uh, pulled out um, Berenstein just the other day. Um, it's a, an excellent uh, reference for uh, variant anatomies. And then, actually, believe it or not, there are things in then Berenstein that are not, uh, or there are things that you will see that Berenstein actually does not talk about. So I go to um, Shane Tubbs for those. Uh, so as you guys may or may not know, just as a quick background, uh, just for this one slide, the imaging technique is that we use uh, fluoroscopic X-ray energy. We use ionated contrast, and that contrast creates uh, the ability to see um, uh, active movement of flow within, uh, within the vascular system. With the advent of digital subtraction now, you have the ability of taking a, a, a still shot, uh, uh, initial subtraction still shot, and then the computer subtracts it pixel by pixel, so that's the term digital subtraction. And then after that subtracted background grays out, then you can actually inject your contrast. The dye becomes um, a, uh, a black upon a gray background. Um, we have the ability of taking, taking that same um, aspect, which is to take a digital subtraction background, inject the dye, and then create what's called a roadmap. So then the third step would be then the uh, actual run of dye then inverts its image, and then it becomes a white image uh, through which now you can actually see the black of your microcatheter or microwire um, superimposed over what used to be the injection of the contrast to show the outline of the vessels. Projections that you may hear, uh, you will probably hear me talk about for the rest of this talk um, are uh, AP, Towns, Water, and Submental. So with the AP tube, so you essentially we're talking about mostly biplanar tubes. With your AP tube, um, a true frontal will actually be a, a transorbital view. That, that view is actually not that useful in uh, looking at the internal carotid artery. Classically, when people will use the misnomer of saying it, even, even I'll, I'll use the term AP for the frontal view of the uh, ICA, it's typically actually more of a slight Towns view. You do that because you actually want to bring the ophthalmic arteries off of the siphon. If you do it straight uh, frontal, you'll actually get uh, the uh, ophthalmic arteries coming at you from the siphon, and it has a superimposition over it. But classically, uh, the, a true frontal view will actually, a true frontal or AP view will be useful if you want to look at the basilar trunk itself, vertebral basilar system. Um, Towns view is, a, a true Towns view actually brings your orbits down probably to the level um, of the frontal fossa, the floor of the frontal fossa, and that's actually very useful to lay the PCAs out. A waters uh, and submental view, a submental view will be um, uh, appropriate view, particularly with an oblique of one side or the other to look at the anterior communicating segment itself. Um, but the submental view um, is essentially looking uh, up the chin. L with your lateral tube, a true lateral, uh, you want to make sure that it's aligned properly. I teach the fellows often that it's, it's important to actually look for a certain anatomy to, to make sure that you actually have uh, the bony anatomy to make sure that the, the lateral tube is uh, in the proper position. And a couple of ways you can look at that. Uh, is to look at the clinoid processes and make sure that they're lining up along with the orbital roof. Uh, another way that people use is the, um, the uh, external auditory meatus, uh, the bony uh, aeration through that. You want to line up the both of those. Now, the thing to keep in mind is that if you line up one, you're probably not going to line up the other. So it depends on the area that you want to focus on. So if you're looking at the vertebral basilar system, then it's probably more appropriate to look up to focus on the meatus, the meati. Uh, as opposed to something like the uh, anterior communicating or the ACAs, you want to actually line up more anteriorly. RAO and LAO, right uh, anterior oblique, left anterior oblique, that's usually done with uh, the AP tube. And we also have the advantage of looking at 3D rotational angiography, which is, uh, if you've not ever seen it done, it's a, a very impressive uh, acquisition. 
where you'll actually do a, a scout image. So, so each image has to have a digital subtraction. So you actually will take uh, something upwards of 120 images in a scout view, and that's just taking the, the soft tissue, bone, et cetera, just like uh, you, you'd be taking it with a, a standard lateral image. And then it swings back, and then it does its injection. Uh, it acquires all those images, and each of those images is digitally subtracted to its pair, uh, and then stacked by the computer in post-process, and then you create a three-dimensional reconstruction that you can then play with, and the computer has an interface to know that with whatever projection you're looking at, whether or not you can actually achieve that, uh, that view with the existing position of the head on that particular table from that acquisition. Uh, this is a quick summary of uh, the anatomy, anatomy that I'm going to overview. The thing that I want to keep in mind, I want you guys to keep in mind, is that uh, the anatomy that I'm going to discuss is anatomy that's kind of purely angiographic. So there is a, a some occasionally there will be differences with, for instance, Roten will write about different anatomy of pica, and he's really talking about surgical anatomy, right? That's relevant to different surgical structures or anatomic structures that you're going to see on the brain. We don't actually see those things, so what we're really only looking at is a relationship to bone and potential relationships to where uh, uh, certain arteries take off. <clears throat> so starting with a cervical carotid artery, uh, uh, bifurcation can, uh, can vary. Obviously, the, can have, you can have a low bifurcation, you can have a high bifurcation. That often dictates what you do in terms of uh, whether or not you need to do a carotid stent or a carotid endarterectomy. Uh, the classic relationship is that the internal carotid artery lies posterior and lateral, which is why if you want to do a bifurcation view, classically this view is the optimum. You, you, whatever artery you're looking at, so if you're looking at the right common carotid artery, you want to lay it out as a right anterior oblique. Um, the uh, carotid bulb is typically for the first couple of centimeters or so is slightly dilated. So when you want to do NASET uh, calculations for stenosis, you want to make sure that you're calculating the normal carotid artery distal to the bulb. Uh, another variant of the uh, carotid uh, bifurcation is that tonsillar loop, so the cervical segment of the internal carotid artery can oftentimes take a very tortuous turn, run very medially, and oftentimes the, the, the same cause of the tonsillar loop uh, on one side is doing it to the other, which is hypertension. The artery elongates and they can come together and they can kiss. And those tonsil that tonsillar loop is so called because it actually si lies behind the tonsils. Uh, early on, people would see a pulsatile mass, the ENT would biopsy it and they would enter the internal carotid artery. Um, moving on. Nomenclature of the internal carotid artery, both in the um, extracranial, intracranial segments, the classic uh, four segments are the cervical, petrous, cavernous, and the supraclinoid. So cervical, uh, as it leads up to the skull base, it enters the skull base, becomes a petrous segment. And I'll show you on angiogram uh, how you can distinguish those two. Uh, there is a uh, artificial segmentation between the petrous and the cavernous because both of those actually are uh, where a segment of it is of the cavernous is actually still running through the bone. Um, and then the cavernous segment will then enter most of the cavernous sinus for the majority of its uh, course. And then it becomes a supraclinoid ICA. This uh, is actually broken down a little bit further by Osborne. Um, sometimes this is uh, important, particularly for the supraclinoid segments, because if you're, if you're trying to give a nomenclature to an aneurysm that you've discovered, uh, the segment along the supraclinoid segment becomes important. But the uh, cervical segment is the same with, uh, with uh, Osborne's nomenclature, the C1 segment. The petrous is actually broken down into a petrous segment and a lacerum segment. And really, if you were to imagine the petrous segment, um, let me back up a little bit. Actually, the distinguishing feature between the petrous and the cavernous is that is that the um, there's a segment called the petrolingual ligament. And that petrolingual ligament is essentially, if you were to divide the first vertical segment intra uh, through the skull of the internal carotid artery, if you divide it in half, above it would be distal to it would be the uh, the cavernous segment. Proximal to it would be the uh, petrous segment. So you have a posterior genu of this petrous segment. And then she divides the anterior genu of that petrous segment into this what's called the lacerum segment. The cavernous segment uh, continues, uh, and that actually stays the same in both Osborne and normal and uh, other nomenclature. So you actually have a posterior genu. It has a horizontal segment, so it has a vertical segment connected to a horizontal segment by that posterior genu. 
and then that horizontal segment will then enter the siphon, and then it becomes a superclinoid segment by as it crosses the clinoid process, uh, giving off its first branch being the ophthalmic. The breakdown of uh, the superclinoid is actually the clinoidal segment, so just the short segment across the clinoid, which most people, if the aneurysm originates from that segment, most people will call those paraclinoid aneurysms. Then there's an ophthalmic segment where there's a clear, uh, that short segment that's clearly involving the ophthalmic artery takeoff. And then from there, uh, it uh, uh, changes once the takeoff of the uh, posterior communicating comes off. And then from the posterior communicating to the terminus uh, is all considered a, the communicating segment. So uh, important branches of the internal carotid artery, uh, I remember even as a medical student, the, uh, the, the acronym of OPA, uh, and that just tells you the order in which it's, uh, the, the branches come off the supraclinoid, the ophthalmic, the petrous, uh, excuse me, the ophthalmic, the posterior communicating, and the anterior choroidal. I'm gonna back up because I remember why I actually had this slide. So here, are the I wanted to go over back the, over the segment. So this is a fairly fairly low um, carotid bifurcation. You have a your C1 segment, your vertical uh, your cervical carotid artery. You can actually see as the um, the uh, there's a little bit of a subtraction artifact, and that's where the carotid artery is actually entering the bone. Uh, then you have your petrous segment. There's that posterior genu, and if you were to break it down into a lacerum segment, that would be the lacerum segment. Then you have that vertical segment where there's a petrolingual ligament will then divide the petrous ICA from the cavernous ICA. You have your posterior genu of your, post, uh, of your cavernous segment. You have your horizontal segment of the carotid, uh, cavernous carotid, and then your siphon. Oops. Um, the, th the one thing that is important uh, to remember uh, is that the takeoff of the ophthalmic artery is classically defined, tells you, the, classically defines uh, the, the dural ring. However, the way that the ophthalmic artery is embryologically developed, it starts out actually in a very um, uh, ventral origin, so it actually comes off the ACA embryologically, and if it, if it, if it stops there and the, and the migration stops, you can actually have an ophthalmic artery that comes off of the uh, ACA. So in about 15% of people, the ophthalmic artery is not in a normal position, so you actually have to pay attention to where the siphon is, uh, and if the ophthalmic lies immediately after the siphon, then the uh, ophthalmic is actually migrated to its proper position. There's a, um, so excuse me, that was a dorsal origin when it comes off the ACA. There's a ventral origin uh, if, the ACA, if the ophthalmic migrates beyond its uh, normal location, it can actually have an extradural origin and in which case it's actually originating from the cavernous segment of the carotid artery. Um, cavernous and petrous branch uh, carotids typically do not have branches, so it's important to, to know that if you do see a branch, it's very likely that that branch is actually going to be a pathological branch um, or some sort of uh, anatomic variant. Classically, the posterior genu of the carotid artery, you may see a tiny wisp of contrast, and what that denotes are the two main branches from the cavernous carotid artery, which are the infralateral trunk and the meningeal hypophyseal trunk. And those two really don't, uh, they're not very robust because they're all they're supplying are the cranial nerves that are passing through the cavernous sinus and the dura itself. Uh, and the, um, uh, the infralateral trunk will also course laterally to supply some of the tentorium. But when they become very, very large, that means that there's some draw that's actually causing them to be hypertrophic. Uh, and we're talking about pathological um, uh, anatomy such as uh, dural fistulas or tentorial fistulas. There are a couple of important anatomic variants to be aware of. When you shoot your lateral um, internal carotid artery run, and the internal carotid artery seems to be more posterior than you're used to, um, then you may be actually dealing with what's called an aberrant ICA. And the aberrant ICA, um, when embryologically the internal carotid artery is creating its final um, uh, conformation, the inferior tympanic branch of the uh, ascending pharyngeal artery does not regress. And it needs to regress in order for the internal carotid artery to become its, to take its normal course through the carotid canal. When it doesn't regress, then that actually, that becomes the intra uh, skull portion of the internal carotid artery. So it actually runs posterior and laterally. And it's typically seen in your, um, uh, your skull films, your temporal bone windows uh, of your CT scan. <clears throat> 
it doesn't really have any pathological variants that are associated with it. The persistent stapedial artery, you may actually see the absence of the middle meningeal artery, so you actually don't have a normal um, uh, foramen spinosum that, uh, that develops. The middle meningeal artery actually courses off of the internal carotid artery as it's running through the temporal bone. Um, the persistent arteries you've all heard of, those are arteries that have abnormal or non-regressed connections between the anterior and the posterior circulation. The most common of these being the persistent trigeminal artery, which I'll show you guys a, a picture of. Um, those arteries are important to look for, particularly in uh, WADA tests, which we don't, we don't do a whole lot of anymore. Uh, with functional MRIs, but when you do a water test, the whole intent of doing the angiogram itself is actually just to make sure you don't have a pathological connection. So if you have persistent uh, trigeminal artery, you will have a rapid cross-filling of the posterior circulation and that you'd have to worry about the, the airway in the, those situations. The thing about uh, persistent trigeminal arteries is, uh, and if you look into Berenstein, there is absolutely it's, it's a free-for-all. So uh, the origin, the anterior origin, the persistent trigeminal artery is almost always at that posterior genuine of the cavernous carotid. However, where it connects to is completely variable, and it's variable based off of where the initial connection was, what was regressed, and what was actually persistent. So you can actually have a persistent trigeminal that connects only to the aica, that only goes to the basilar trunk, that only goes to an SCA, or even potentially to a PCA. I've not actually ever seen a uh, persistent trigeminal that connects to the pica, but I'm sure it's been reported. So here's a picture of a persistent trigeminal. This is actually from an MRA. Um, so at first glance, you may say that's just the posterior communicating, but when you pay a closer attention, you realize that the origin of that artery is coming from the posterior genu, right, where a posterior communicating would actually come off the communicating segment here. And in this case, this persistent trigeminal is just uh, attaching to the, the basilar trunk. Some common disorders that are associated with pathology along the internal carotid artery. Here's a picture of a petrous uh, aneurysm. So petrous aneurysms are actually fairly rare. Um, in order for them to, to, to develop, they actually end up having to erode the petrous bone. Um, but they can, they can progress, and if they grow superiorly, then they're going to potentially enter the enter and encroach the cavernous sinus, and you can present with a cavernous sinus syndrome. Uh, in true cavernous carotid arteries, so this is a a poor quality angiogram, I apologize, but the origin of the aneurysm is actually down here uh, in the horizontal segment, so it's below the siphon. So a cavernous carotid artery can actually grow and erode through uh, dura and actually enter the intracranial space. So not all cavernous aneurysms um, uh, are, could, uh, if they're asymptomatic, could still be considered benign. They can also encroach enough that if they were to rupture, they could actually cause fatal subdural hemorrhage as well. Classically, the cavernous sinus syndrome, uh, the more posterior you are, the more likely you're actually going to have uh, encroachment of the cranial nerves, 3, 4, 6, V1 and V2. Um, anteriorly, at that point, a lot of those nerves have actually already uh, uh, diverged and are entering the superior orbital fissure. Here's a picture of an aneurysm, potentially a, a, a carotid cave aneurysm. This is where 3D rotational angiography is very important. Um, the, the location of the neck of this aneurysm relative to the takeoff of the ophthalmic artery is going to be the most crucial uh, piece of information for you to decide whether or not this is actually a true cerebral aneurysm. Carotid cave aneurysms, uh, uh, some people don't believe that carotid cave aneurysms really exist. They just say they're either, you're either an aneurysm that's in a cavernous segment or in a superior hypophyseal segment. I was always taught that the carotid cave uh, and if you read uh, articles about the anatomy of the carotid cave, the carotid cave aneurysm classically is at the level of the siphon, at the level of the ophthalmic artery. Um, it has to be really uh, uh, juxtaposed to the origin of the ophthalmic artery. They typically uh, project inferiorly and medially, and that is that potential space called the carotid cave. Roten did dissections of carotid caves, uh, what were thought to be carotid caves, and half of them were actually truly intradural and half of, them, half of them were actually extradural. So if there's a chance that they could actually be intradural, uh, we, I tend to treat the carotid caves uh, because they have that potential. Uh, here's a picture, probably more of a superior hypophyseal aneurysm. So superior hypophyseal aneurysm as opposed to uh, carotid cave, which, uh, like I said, points uh, medially and inferiorly. A superior hypophyseal tends to point more just purely inferiorly, and it's a little bit more 
as you can see in this case, a little bit more distal to the takeoff of the ophthalmic. So there's the ophthalmic, and a little bit further back is actually the superior hypophyseal. Named so because from that segment, if you dissect it um, under a microscope, there are small branches that actually will course towards the uh, solid tersica and supply. Um, excuse me, they'll, they'll cor uh, course towards the uh, hypothesis. So um, here's another picture of a uh, superior hypothesis aneurysm. Here there's a picture of obviously the bigger uh, gorilla is the, the MCA aneurysm, but here's a, a picture of uh, a medial paraclinoid aneurysm, and you can see how important it is actually to say where the relationship to the ophthalmic artery is. Moving on to different segmental aneurysms, here's what's called a paraophthalmic aneurysm. So you, if you identify, again, the origin of the ophthalmic, uh, if the aneurysm points laterally and is distal to that, then it actually is uh, what's called a paraophthalmic aneurysm. Classically, like I said, they, they point a little bit more lateral um, uh, if you were to look on the straight AP view. One thing to keep in mind when you, when you term uh, aneurysms that are arising from uh, adjacent or juxtaposed to the origin of the ophthalmic artery, the, cl the, the correct nomenclature is, is actually a carotid ophthalmic. So the aneurysms are a carotid ophthalmic aneurysms. When you say the ophthalmic artery, you can have, as, as I'm actually seeing currently, there's a patient that I have that actually has an aneurysm arising from the ophthalmic itself. And that can actually be a problem because as they are enter the the orbit, they can actually have problems with compressing the, ophthalmic, uh, the optic nerve. Well, I wanted to back up also, actually, I take that back. I have another image of another cavernous aneurysm. Uh, posterior communicating aneurysms. This is actually is a picture of a, a fetal PCA, kind of similar to Dr. He's um, image. So in, you know that this is actually a fetal PCA because from this run, there's actually no evidence of any sort of washout. So even though it has a fairly normal uh, anatomy of uh, PCOM and then it's probably entering like the P2, 3, 4 sort of anatomy, there's no washout. So uh, where you would expect the basilar to come up and connect with that communicating, you'd have some sort of aspect of non-iodinated contrast mixing with this iodinated contrast. But the fact that there is none means that this is actually a fetal PCA. This is actually a difficult aneurysm um, because it's actually involving such a, 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 a dominant artery. Now, it may be actually be a little bit easier to treat because there's actually a little bit of a neck there. Classically, though, posterior communicating aneurysms are named so because they're actually really coming from that posterior communicating segment. So an aneurysm can lie adjacent to or distal to that posterior communicating uh, origin stem itself. Here's a picture of a... Uh, uh, probably a CTA reconstruction of both. You can have an aneurysm, as in this case, uh, originating from both the uh, uh, posterior communicating aneurysm as well as an anterior choroidal. You can see the branch of the anterior choroidal itself. On the lateral, it's very difficult to tell um, from the stem itself which, what's a posterior communicating, what's the anterior choroidal. One of the ways you can actually distinguish those two is that the posterior communicating is a little bit larger. The uh, anterior choroidal has a fairly standard size, whereas posterior communicatings will vary based on their size, based off of how much they're contributing to the posterior circulation. On the lateral view, though, the course is essentially the same. On the, on the AP view, it's a little bit more useful to, to look at the AP view because the posterior communicating will actually take a fairly medial um, and straight uh, course, whereas the anterior choroidal will take a, initially a straight course and then it'll dive laterally. And that's the importance of that. Uh, also doing later views of that to see what that branch is actually doing. So if it uh, anterior choroidal, obviously will, you'll start seeing a choroidal blush at the more lateral aspects and that's what that's doing is supplying the choroid in the temporal horn. The posterior communicating, you should really only see a pacification for a short segment, and then it will likely wash out because of uh, mixing with uh, non-contrasted blood from the basilar, vertebral basilar system. So uh, I'm not going to talk much about fistulas, but I'm just going to talk about uh, disorders. Um, uh, of the cavernous itself, so cavernous sinus syndrome, which I mentioned from an aneurysm. You can also get a cavernous sinus syndrome from a CC fistula, so carotid cavernous fistula. Uh, the anatomy of this is actually important to distinguish by looking at both the internal injections and your external injections. The, the biggest dichotomy to make is to distinguish the 
direct CC fistula, which is much more rare than the indirect CC fistula. The direct fistula is really a rent in the artery, and actually the first uh, human uh, that ever had coils, the initial GDC coils placed, was a, a lady that actually had a known cavernous aneurysm, and that cavernous aneurysm ruptured, creating the hole between the, uh, it, the cavernous carotid artery and the cavernous sinus. Majority, like I said, though, are actually indirect fistulas, and indirect fistulas are usually supplied. You can't actually tell if you, if you do an injection and there's a, a, a lot of contrast enhancement in the cavernous sinus, if it's very rapid flow, very rapid shunting, you actually cannot tell uh, uh, whether or not there's a rent or not, because if the ILT, the inferior lateral trunk and the meningo hypophyseal trunk are giving such rapid supply to the cavernous sinus, um, it'll pass by the cavernous sinus very quickly. So the external carotid artery branch injection is going to be the most important, because in a direct CC fistula, you should really not have any external carotid supply. Cavernous sinus syndrome, as, uh, as I mentioned, uh, usually extraocular movements uh, is going to be a very sensitive detector for that early onset of that syndrome. Uh, another cavernous carotid aneurysm that can actually get large as they start growing up, uh, they can actually start up compressing, and as, as well as the large ophthalmic aneurysms, as they grow up, they can start moving the chiasm or compressing opt uh, optic nerves, uh, so you may actually present with vision loss. That's actually a very important thing to get a baseline study for based off of uh, prior to sort of any sort of intervention that you're going to make. Uh, anterior communicating aneurysms, uh, which this is not, uh, can also uh, grow superiorly and they can also compress the chiasm. Anterior choroidal aneurysms, which are, are fairly few and far between, they, you need to be very cautious about them there, and they're fairly unique in that when they rupture, they're the, the one aneurysm that can rupture, and if it ruptures in the right direction, the, the tracking of the anterior choroidal itself, like I said, it goes posteriorly first and then laterally, it enters through the anterior choroidal fissure, and so blood can enter just the temporal horn, and you may present with no, very little subarachnoid hemorrhage, but predominantly blood in the, uh, in the temporal horn, and that would be uh, very indicative of an anterior choroidal aneurysm. The uh, anterior choroidals, when they're coiled, you also have to be very careful to make sure that that aneurysm is fairly separate from the anterocoidal itself. Uh, and if not, then it may be something that you want to discuss with your, um, uh, or approach from an open perspective so that you can actually have direct visualization, the direct visualization of the choroidal itself. Um, I, I recall as a fellow having an anterocoidal that looked fairly straightforward. And probably as the aneurysm was thrombosing, some thrombus migrated into the ostium of the anterocoidal, and the patient woke up with a very disabling hemiplegia. So classically, the anterior choroidal syndrome, as you know, the anterior choroidal supplies the internal capsule, the posterior genio, the internal posterior limb of the internal capsule. So that gives rise to a, a dense hemiplegia. And the anterior choroidal also more distally supplies some of the epithalamic structures, such as the, um, uh, the uh, lateral geniculate body. So classically, the anterior choroidal syndrome is a hemiplegia in addition to a sector anopsia. So there's a picture of somebody that we treated with uh, anterior um, choroidal rupture, and then there was blood uh, in the, predominantly in the horn. There's a picture of a, this is actually just an MRI from, of a patient that had an internal capsule infarct, so anterior choroidal occlusion, and you can see the, the, uh, the distribution of, uh, of the infarct being in the posterior, posterior limb. Posterior communicating aneurysms, uh, important to keep in mind, sometimes you can actually take the posterior communicating if it involves the aneurysm as long as you can show that the P1 segment is sufficient to supply the, the cortex. Uh, infarcts of the posterior communicating, or as you're, if you're doing some sort of intervention of an aneurysm of posterior communicating, you do have to remember that the posterior communicating itself, even though there is to and fro flow, uh, posterior communicating does give rise to thalamic perforators. Anteriorly, the posterior and at, at the ICA terminus, uh, there are many perforators that will arise posteriorly and run medially, and so they supply the ventral medial thalamus. As they run more posteriorly, uh, as they course more posteriorly, they can start giving supply along the lines of the P1 and P2 to the posterior uh, lateral thalamus. And here's a a uh, diagram of all the different locations of, uh, of aneurysms and the nomenclatures of the aneurysms. Uh, the one thing that is uh, 
these aneurysms here arising from the P1 segment, let me get that arrow, are, are kind of rare, um, as well as the junction of the PCOM and the P2 segment. P1s and P2 aneurysms are kind of rare. Uh, the one thing to keep in mind is that there's what's called the SCA aneurysm, and really the, that aneurysm has to arise from the distal to the SCA itself, and um, before the P1 segment, and those are classically referred to as SCA aneurysms. Anywhere else along here are considered basilar trunk aneurysms. And here's a picture of a persistent uh, proatlantal artery. ICA terminus, the ICA terminus is, uh, I'll go on to the next slide, the ICA terminus aneurysms have to, you have to be cautious that they can give off perforators, particularly on the posterior aspect of the ICA. Uh, that they give supply to the anterior perforated substance, right? So uh, as I'll show you, the A1 and M1 segments also give rise to lenticular striates. Uh, all of those actually go through the anterior perforated substance, which, is the, which has the tiny holes that you guys have seen that those lenticular striates are perforating through. That APS uh, is actually a very important structure for both memory and for uh, behavioral aspects uh, of uh, personality. Moving on to the uh, cortical branches, so the anterior cerebral is, um, uh, I refer to either from with three segments or four segments. Uh, the A1 segment is best viewed on this AP view. As you can see, the A1 at, at the ICA terminus, as it bifurcates, the M1 runs laterally, A1 runs anteriorly. Uh, it runs anteriorly and medially, and that A1 segment is the, the, the pre-communicating segment. The post-communicating segment is obviously after the takeoff of, of the connection with the communicating artery, and that is usually a position where the uh, ACA makes a, a sharp turn. Nomenclature for aneurysms in this area, the uh, true communicating aneurysm is, is probably a little bit more rare than we, we, we think. The uh, an A1-A2 junction aneurysm is probably a little bit more common, but people kind of just lump those two together uh, as communicating aneurysms. The, uh, Lateral view becomes a little bit more useful to look at the distal branches of the ACA. Uh, so usually there's a, um, a short segment of the A1 which runs medially, and so, that, so for that segment you actually don't see, that's probably that A1 segment right there. There's a short segment post-communicating of this A2, which is also referred to as the, um, uh, uh, the post-communicating. Some people will actually call this segment the A3 segment because it's a subgenual segment which has a, a little bit uh, different of anatomy because it's sitting below the genu of the corpus callosum. And then uh, these are the uh, more distal cortical branches, the A3 or A4, uh, which commonly the, the, the three main arteries that you need to be aware of is sometimes there's a medial frontal candelabra and that's actually supplying a lot of the medial frontal anterior branches of the, uh, or excuse me, territory of the frontal lobe, uh, pericolosal, which will run along the uh, corpus callosum itself and often terminates into a splenial artery, and then the callosal marginal, which will actually run uh, medially and supply part of the uh, um, uh, paracentral lobule, so the uh, cortex to the, the foot and the leg. Uh, I mentioned the medial lenticular striates. Let me back up here. And so what you would see is um, there's a lot of variability in the lenticular striates, but the, the, I think of the A1 and the M1 as a continuous uh, segment of, the, uh, of an artery that's all supplying the lenticular striates. So you can have medial lenticular striates and the lateral lenticular striates. Best, again, seen on that AP view. Um, the colossal arteries I talked about, um, the splenial artery, so the splenium is actually fairly uh, considered, considered a, a watershed zone, but it's a zone that's actually very useful for, for instance, for moya moya. It's an area where collaterals can uh, occur. And the distal most aspect of that uh, pericolosal artery becomes the posterior splenial artery, excuse me, the anterior splenial artery, whereas the PCA will give rise to the posterior splenial arteries, and that uh, collateral zone is where blood is shared and where um, occlusion of the ACA may get reconstituted across that splenial zone. And azygous ACA is actually fairly rare. Um, we'll see a couple, we'll see a lot of aneurysms that arise from a dominant A1 where there's a aplastic A1 on the contralateral side. And that actually still has a very high risk of aneurysm development at the communicating uh, segment. Uh, 
But a true azagous ACA is fairly rare where there's an A1 that actually supplies the A2. It's a single trunk of an A2 and A3, and then it may not actually terminate until it actually becomes two uh, distal cortical branches of the pericolosal. Uh, and azagous ACAs are also very uh, associated with dysplastic uh, and fusiform aneurysms. Recurrent artery of Huebner, uh, when you do an LAO view of a left internal carotid artery, you can actually see a recurrent branch. And actually, the, the classic teaching of that anterior recurrent artery of Huebner is that it supplies the uh, caudate head and the anterior limb of the internal capsule, excuse me, the genu of the internal capsule. Um, I, I find that the caudate head is almost always taken out when you have an M1 occlusion. So I'm not sure how true the, the recurrent artery of Huebner is in terms of supplying that caudate head. Um, but the classic teaching is if you occlude the ACA and you have a recurrent artery of Huebner, you'll actually have uh, a weakness of the head, weakness of the face, weakness of the leg with preservation of the arm. And the reason for that is you take out the, the, the genu of the internal capsule by taking the Huebner out, and then you take out the cortical supply uh, due to the distal ACA occlusion. Uh, the other syndrome to keep in mind, anterior communicating syndrome, so the large anterior communicatings uh, or ruptured anterior communicatings, particularly on the posterior aspect of the communicating segment, gives rise uh, to supply to the fornix. So you can actually have somebody that can be very alive, awake, following commands, and they're completely disabled because they have absolutely no memory. They have no ability to consolidate new memories. Segments of the middle cerebral artery are the uh, uh, M1 through the M4. You have a sphenoidal segment, an insular segment, an opercular segment, and a cortical segment. And I'll show you different ways to look at that. For, as, as I mentioned with the A1, the M1 is also best viewed on the AP view, or the slightly Towns view. And that is here with a right ICA injection. Uh, this horizontal segment. Uh, running, uh, also, also known as the sphenoidal segment, gives rise to those lenticular striates. It makes a turn. It actually uh, usually bifurcates. The MCA bifurcation or trifurcation occurs at the end of that insular seg uh, sphenoidal segment, at which then you become the insular branches, or the M2 segment. The M2 segments are all kind of superimposed on the AP view, best viewed on the lateral view. But I, I like this view. To, uh, to illustrate that it's what it's doing is it's actually these branches are actually running along the insula. And so when you have an M1 or an M2 occlusion, one of the uh, early signs and the early areas of infarct is the insula itself. Because the M2, even though it doesn't give off direct branches that you can visualize, as it's hugging the insula itself, it's giving tiny little perforators. And that's how the insula gets its blood supply. It hits the roof of the sylvian fissure, and then the branches will come out into the M3 segment because they're, uh, they're underneath the frontal operculum, above the temporal operculum. And at that point, they've already been predestined to be either supersylvian MCA or infrasylvian MCA, as defined by are they supplying the temporal lobe or are they supplying the frontal and parietal lobe. Moving on to the lateral view, the uh, well, actually, since I have this AP view up, uh, one of the things that uh, I want to touch on our, uh, some branches and variants. So the accessory and duplication MCA, you may often hear. The accessory MCA is actually a branch that comes off the A1 that runs parallel to the M1. So you may actually get a CTA or MRA and, and realize, hey, well, there's actually a kind of a duplicated M1. And the reason for that is um, uh, you have an accessory M1 or, or you have a duplicated M1, which comes off the ICA terminus before the actual termination, uh, ICA terminus itself. So that's the uh, AP view. Moving on to the lateral view, here's a, a magged up view. So if you, you've heard of the Sylvian triangle, so the angiography on lateral from an ICA injection, it's important to identify the Sylvian triangle. So that triangle is actually larger anteriorly and tapers posteriorly. So it's, a, I guess, it's an isosceles triangle. Um, and the reason for that is because the insula runs in that fashion. So uh, all those arteries are kind of free to, to hug the insula. But when they hit the roof of the uh, operculum, the roof of the sylvian fissure, um, they're going to then come out as M3 branches and then course out over them. So because the insula becomes smaller posteriorly, eventually the arteries are going to get to a point where they don't really hit much of an opercular um, roof, and so they come out straight. And so in, that, in this case, if you were to draw the line of this uh, 
uh, Sylvia triangle, this would be the apex of that isosceles triangle, and then this artery itself becomes the angular artery, so named because it's the, the, the angle of that Sylvian triangle. So from the ang angle, uh, the angular artery, you can then count backwards. There's a posterior parietal, anterior parietal, and then you get a posterior frontal, middle frontal, anterior frontal, and then your uh, prefrontal candelabra. Um, so all these branches, when you once you identify that Sylvian triangle and you identify where the arteries are coming out of that Sylvian fissure, once they start coursing down, then you can actually say that you can call those actually temporal branches, and anything above that will be frontal or parietal branches, as I discussed. Nomenclature of the vertebral artery switching gears. So the vertebral artery has four segments, uh, a V1, 2, 3, and 4. And they're actually uh, denoted by, the, it's a little bit easier to remember because they're denoted by wh where they're actually uh, going through. So the uh, extra osseous segment, short segment of the V1, then it enters the foramina transversaria. Uh, for a long segment becoming uh, V2, usually at the level of C6 is where it starts. Pops out and becomes extra spinal, meaning extra outside of the bony spine. And then as it enters the dura, uh, there's usually a short uh, segment, uh, a short area where the artery appears to be a little bit narrowed, and that's actually where it's entering the dura, and then it becomes the intradural segment or the V4 segment. Uh, branches of the vertebral artery, you can actually have vertebral arteries that are duplicated. Uh, commonly, the duplications occur um, at the uh, V1, 2 junctions or V2, V3 junctions. The uh, important branches to remember from the vertebral artery are the anterior spinal. Usually it occurs, the, the most uh, cephalad portion of the ASA occurs uh, at the VB junction and then it runs caudally, but all along, uh, particularly along in the, uh, the V2 segment, you can get muscular collaterals that will actually contribute uh, to the anterior spinal artery. Pica has a lot of variability. It can actually originate as an extra dural pica and then penetrate alongside the V3, V4 junction entering the dura. Uh, you can also have uh, intradural picas that have a course of their tonsor loop coming all the way out extra dural, then making their way all the way back in. And then there's a posterior meningeal artery that can actually have an extremely variable origin. Typically, it comes off the vertebral artery itself, but can actually come off the pica as well. And the posterior meningeal becomes relevant for, uh, for AVMs or uh, dural fistulas that occur in the posterior fossa. Pica anatomy, classically and geographically, the pica uh, segments are broken into the, uh, the medullary segments. So there's anterior medullary, lateral medullary, and then a posterior medullary, medullary as it's wrapping around. And as it's doing that, it's giving off the tiny little perforators to the medulla itself. So classically, the, a, a, true, a true Wallenberg syndrome really should be a vertebral occlusion that's actually including the origin of the pica because all of those pica perforators just have no perfusion pressure, uh, and then you end up getting that um, uh, medullary infarct. Tonsillar loop. So a, a, on the lateral, beyond the, the medullary segments, there is a uh, typically a bifurcation of the pica then into where it becomes a tonsillar branch and then a hemispheric branch. The hemispheric branch better visualized on the AP because it's coursing on the inferior surface of the cerebellum and it's running laterally. And then the tonsillar segment is running a little more medially. And that tonsillar segment will come up into the, for, into the roof of the fourth ventricle. And a, a key important point there is what's called the choroidal point. And from that point, uh, there are some perforators that come off and they give rise to blood supply uh, to the roof of the fourth ventricle. So from an em embolization perspective, beyond there, if you're going to lose, use liquid embolics, you're, you're safer uh, because you don't want any reflux to uh, uh, injure the, um, what's lying there, which is essentially going to be the facial colliculus, um, uh, a lot of the, the motor cranial nerves, uh, as well as the reticular formation, the pontine reticular formation. Vertebral basilar fusion, uh, so it's, think of it as a zipper. So essentially you have two parallel basilar arteries uh, and uh, the, the, the normal fusion is that you, you get the vertebral basilar superiorly and then it fuses all the way down and then you, you're left with the two vertebral arteries. But as it, if it doesn't fuse properly, you can either have a vertebral basilar that is a, the, the basilar tip is a low riding vertebral basilar or you can actually give, because of that fusion, you can give, uh, you can observe 
multiple areas of fenestrations, and those fenestrations are incomplete fusions of the vertebrals uh, together. Branches of the basilar trunk itself, um, usually the basilar, the, the main uh, gives rise mainly to the aicas, but all along here you get to get short perforators, uh, short pontine perforators that come really from the posterior aspect of the basilar, and then the long circumferentials which come out a little bit more laterally. Uh, aicas, so on a straight view, a straight, I mentioned before that the straight frontal is actually a great view for the vertebral basilar, and it's actually a good spot to make sure that you can actually see the watershed zone of the aica, pica, and the SCA. So when you run the, the and with a straight lateral, you'll see that as well. When you let the, the uh, angiogram run into the later phase, into the capillary phase, you'll typically see a tiny little line that runs kind of in the middle of the cerebellum, and that's actually the watershed zone. And same thing with the straight frontal view. The aica will run laterally, and in the later capillary phase, you'll see a kind of a faint line, and that's actually showing you the watershed zone. <clears throat> so if you have some sort of flow limitation, you may actually see a delay in one side versus the other. I talked about the pontine perforators. SCA, the superior cerebellar artery, is probably one of the most variable arteries uh, out there. So you can have SCAs that are duplicated, you can have SCAs, as in this picture, that the SCA actually arises from the P1 segment. You can have SCAs that arise from the P2 segment. Um, and uh, you can even, I've also seen an SCA that arises from one side and crosses the basilar to, cross to, to supply the other side. Um, basilar tip is important as it uh, gives rise to uh, uh, thalamic uh, perforators, so the uh, medial thalamic perforators, the uh, posterior medial aspect of the thalamus is supplied by the uh, basilar tip. Um, that's about all I wanted to cover there. Segments of the posterior cerebral artery. Some are viewed best on AP, some are viewed best on lateral. Uh, this is where I told you the steep towns, excuse me, is useful because you can actually lay out the, the PCAs and see them along their full course. Uh, the lateral, it's tough because the PCAs are superimposed, particularly if you have two big P1s. So this is where it's very useful to do that Schuler view where you actually bring the lateral tube off and you can actually um, uh, bring P1s and P1s off. You can also do the same thing with the PICAs. The segments of these PCAs are the pre-communicating. So on this AP view, you can see on the lateral view, these are all superimposed. But on the AP view, you actually have this P P1, the first segment, usually actually in the, in the uh, intrapeduncular fossa, running in the intrapeduncular fossa. At that apex, it's going to be the uh, apex of the crux of the cerebri, or the cerebral peduncles, and that's usually where the posterior communicating plugs in. After that posterior communicating, it becomes the ambient segment or the P2 segment. It's running a little bit more laterally and then posteriorly, and, uh, and it's surrounded essentially by the peduncle. Around this course, it's important that PCA occlusions can actually be very destabling as well because it gives off perforators to the peduncle. So as you remember your anatomy, the anterior aspect of the cerebral peduncle is where all those coracospinal tracts lie. So that P1 segment, if you have a very proximal PCA occlusion, you may end up having a peduncular infarct uh, because the, uh, uh, the perforators are compromised. Quadrigeminal segment, it's wrapping around at this point. Um, and as the P3 segment, it's named so quadrigeminal because it's sitting in the quadrigeminal cistern, again, named after the, uh, the colliculi which will be right here. So as that P P3 right, uh, comes around, perforators are also actually supplying the colliculi, and very adjacent to the colliculi is going to be the, the third nerve nucleus. So you can actually have a third nerve palsy if you have an extensive PCA infarct. And then it terminates into the calcarine artery. PCAs from the P1, P2 uh, segments, you often will have choroidal branches. So there's posterior medial, which will actually run uh, uh, fairly superiorly and fairly midline, and they'll actually enter the uh, to supply the, the choroid in the third ventricle. The posterior lateral cho um, choroidals typically arise from the P2s. They will run in a posterior course through the posterior choroidal fissure to supply the choroid in the atrium. And as they do that, they can actually, they're giving rise to blood supply to the hippocampus, to the posterior temporal lobe uh, as they're entering that choroidal fissure uh, all through its course. The, uh, the thing that I did remember that I, I was trying to think of what I was trying to say, the uh, basilar tip, sometimes you can actually have the artery of Percheron. 
So as opposed to having kind of a bilateral diffuse supply to the uh, posterior thalamus, you can actually have a combined trunk, and that combined trunk can actually arise from uh, anywhere along the uh, basilar tip, even uh, to as, la as far lateral as the P1s. And that's important to, to keep an eye out for if you're treating a basilar tip aneurysm or you're doing some sort of basilar um, thrombectomy that, that uh, artery perch run is uh, a vulnerable vessel.